Hey everyone, this is Brady, the Game Dev Artisan. In today's video, we're going to continue our series on the Godot fundamentals. We'll be introducing a camera with different modes that will follow our mouse or focus on a target. We'll also be setting up a custom cursor icon, and we'll be modifying our tank's turret to be controlled by our mouse by always pointing in the direction of our mouse cursor. To get started, we'll open up our game scene. We'll be adding a camera 2D to our nodes. Now this camera will have additional functionality, so we'll need to create a script that will be stored in our scenes UI folder. We can just call this camera.gd. Now we'll start by giving our camera a class name of camera, and our camera will have different modes. And to signify these different modes, we'll use an enumerator that we'll call modes, and we'll start with a target and a target mouse blended. Now to better control our camera, we'll add some export variables that will define our target. It will be of type node. And we'll also need a mode variable to control which mode we start with. This will be of type modes from our enumerator. And we can use the default of modes.targetMouseBlended. Now we'll also want some smoothing and maximum distance values that we can define. We'll start with our max distance. This will control the amount that our camera can span out from our target, in this case, our tank. And lastly, we'll set a smooth speed. And this will control the rate at which our camera moves. Next, we'll define some internal variables that will keep track of our target position. We can set this equal to a default vector 2.infinite. We'll also set up a fallback target. We'll use this as a reference to our predefined target that's coming from our export variable. It will be used in instances where we clear our target when we switch our camera mode, or if the target that we're focusing on gets destroyed. To do that, inside our ready function, we'll just set our fallback target equal to the target that we've defined in our export. For our camera to move, we want to set up our process function for each different camera mode. We'll do this by using our match statement which is going to look at our camera's current mode. And depending on each mode, we'll run a specific set of logic. For example, for our target, all we simply want to do is check if we have a target. We want to take our target's position. We'll set that equal to the current target and its position. Fairly simple. Make sure you put your S for your mode. Next, we'll define for our mode's target mouse blended. In this case, we still want to check if we have a target. And if so, we're going to take our mouse position, we'll get this from our local mouse position, and we're going to update our target's position by taking the target position, adding in that mouse position. We'll then need to take this new target position and clamp the X and Y positions using the clamp function. Here we'll take our target position's X value, and we'll set it to a minimum of the max distance plus our target position.x, the maximum value of our max distance, plus our target position.x. We'll repeat this for our y position. What this will do is keep us within that radius of the max distance. So our camera will never span beyond our target's position outside of the range of that max distance. And lastly, we'll check if our target position has been defined and is no longer set to that vector 2.infinite in which case we can take our position and we can use linear interpolation using the lerp function to take our current position and move it towards our new target position at a rate of that smooth speed multiplied by our delta value. This is where we will receive our smoothing effect over time as our camera moves towards its eventual target position. Next, inside our camera, we'll set up some convenience functions to be able to change our mode. This will take in a modes type of variable. And this will set our mode to our new mode. We'll also create a function for changing our target. Here we'll check if we have a new target. We also want to check if our current target and the target that we're targeting is exiting the tree, whether or not we have a connected signal called clear target. If so, we want to make sure that we take our target and disconnect that same signal. In the case of our new target, we'll set it equal to the new target variable. And we'll connect our new target 
and it exits the tree, we want to connect our clear target function. Now, what is this clear target function? Well, let's define that down here. This function clear target. All we simply want to do is take our current target and equal it to our fallback target, which in our case should be our tank. In this case, we'll change our mode back to our target mouse blended. The reason we're doing this is if we target a, another object in our scene, and in the event that the object gets removed from our scene tree, we'll no longer have a valid position for our camera to move towards. This covers the camera script, so we can go ahead and select our camera again from our scene tree, and inside, we'll go ahead and set our new exports. Here, we'll assign our target equal to our tank. For our mode, we'll use our default target mouse blended. We can set our max distance to the default 50, and let's try our smooth speed set to two. Next, inside our camera's limits, we'll want to define where our camera can pan to. This is great if we look at our 2D scene. We visualize what it means to have a limit on our camera. Your camera 2D should be drawing some debug rectangles to show where the camera is covering. That can be seen in the editor section with the draw screen and draw limits. Here, we can set our left and top to zero. This means that our camera 2D will not be able to pan left or up beyond the limit that we've defined. What this means is as our tank gets closer to the edge of the screen, the tank will actually be able to move closer to the wall without the camera following it along. We can also do the same thing to the right. Now, I'll take a moment to update my map to give us a little bit more space to be able to move around with. We'll expand our world borders. Now that I've expanded the world, we can go ahead and update our limit to the right side to be about where we ended up over here, which would be about 3,024 to the right. And on our bottom, we're about 1570 pixels. If we double check, we can see our limit line is not quite there, so we can go ahead and bump the right over. Now our pixels are 16 wide, so that's an extra 32. Now, Godot has a great feature where you can just say plus 32. It'll do the math for you. We can see our edge actually goes down just shy. So we can do the same thing here. Plus 16. There we go. Now, it's important to note that inside our position smoothing, we have this disabled. And this is another option to smoothly move your camera's position towards its target position. But because we're using pixel art, it tends to lead to some tearing. So we'll go ahead and leave this disabled. Next, to demonstrate that we're going to be using our targeting mode, we'll need to create a way to retrieve the nearest crate to our tank, which we can then use to target from our camera. To do this, we'll create a new static function within our world script. We'll call this get closest crate to, and it'll accept a position and return a crate. Now to do this, we'll need to keep track of which our current closest crate is, and by default, there's none. And here we'll need to check what its closest distance is. And by default, we're infinitely close. Now to do this, we'll take our children in our instance of our tile map dot get children. This will iterate over each child within our tile maps instances. Quick check to see if a child is of type crate. And if so, we're going to get its distance from our position using the distance to function. This will look at the child's position, and if we don't have our closest value defined, or, and two pipes equals or, or you could type or, our statement of distance being less than our closest distance, which by default is infinitely close, so any value will be less than infinite. If that's the case, then we can set our new closest value equal to the current child, and the closest distance equal to that distance value. Once we've looped through all of our children, we'll go ahead and return the closest that we found. Now we'll actually grab this crate 
within our game script to do the transition. To do this, we'll create a new function that will run at the start of the game, we'll call it start game. And here we want to await and we'll call that timer by saying get tree dot create underscore timer, which will create a scene tree timer. And we'll wait about two seconds and wait for that timeout to occur. This means that once we call this function, it'll wait about two seconds and then it'll start by grabbing a crate from our world, get closest crate to our tanks position. And if we didn't get a crate, something went wrong, we maybe didn't define them in our scene. Otherwise, we'll continue. We're gonna set a value on our tank called has control. We'll set this up shortly as it doesn't exist in our tank currently. But when we transition away from our tank and focus on a crate, we will actually want to disable the control scheme that we have while we go into something like a cinematic. And here we'll take our camera, we'll set the change mode to our camera dot modes dot target. Now to do this, we need to set a reference to our camera. We do this again by clicking our camera 2D into our game scene, hold control, release. Now we have an on ready bind to our camera 2D and we'll just call this camera, which is of type camera. And once we've changed the mode, we also want to take our camera and change the target. We'll set this equal to the crate. And now we'll set another await by calling the same get tree dot create timer. And this time we'll wait about three seconds. Wait for that to time out. And we'll change our camera back to our tank. Do this by calling camera dot change target. Set it back to our tank. And we'll change our mode back to our camera modes target mouse blended. And then we'll set that our tank has control again. Now we can quickly update our tank's control using this has control boolean by opening up our tank script. We'll define a new variable at the top. We'll call this has control and it'll be equal to true by default. To limit our control inside our physics process, at the very beginning, we'll check if we don't have control, then we want to just return, meaning that we won't be processing any of our input or movement. We can also add the same function inside our input that says if we don't have control that we want to return. This is called an early return and prevents anything inside your function from running if this case is true. Now, if we return back to our game, we need to call our start function within our ready. Now, it's important to note that if we were to call our start game within our ready function, that would normally be fine. Because in Godot, whenever you have a ready function called, it assumes that the children inside that node have already processed their ready function. In this case, our game has a child of world and the world has a child of tile map. And normally the children process their ready functions first. Now there is an issue open for the tile map where it's children's ready function actually run after the tile maps ready function. So in our case, if we call start game now, the crate doesn't exist because the scene collection within our tile map haven't actually created any scenes and added them to our scene tree. So what we need to do instead is use the call deferred function, passing in the string name of our start game. If we look at the documentation, we can see here that this calls the method of the object during idle time, which means in our context, that this start game function will run after our tile map should have completed its initial ready function and its children have been added to the scene. Note that this behavior may change in future versions of Godot. I will link to the GitHub issue in the description below. Next, for our target focusing, I'd like to add a letterbox effect to our UI. If we open up our UI scene and inside of our control node, we'll add a new control node We'll call this letterbox. And inside here, we can go ahead and add a color rectangle that we will call top rectangle. And if we duplicate that, create a second called bottom rectangle. We can select both those and give them access to unique names. And if we go to our 2D view, we can select our letterbox, select the anchor presets. We'll select full rectangle to span our letterbox across our entire UI. Now for our top rectangle, 
We'll select our anchor preset and we'll use the top wide, which will pin it to the top and span the width of our screen. We'll do the same for our bottom, except we'll pin it to the bottom using the bottom wide preset. For both of these, we can select them both and select their color to black. Next, inside our UI, we'll add a new animation player. This animation player will be used to control a animation for opening and closing our letterbox. We can create that animation under our animation editor by selecting animation new. We'll call this open letterbox. We'll leave the length default to one. And we'll need to add a track for both our top rectangle and bottom rectangles custom minimum size property. We can do this, select your top, and we can add a keyframe for our custom minimum size where we start at zero. We can create our reset tracks. We'll do the same thing for our bottom rectangle. Then we can click and drag to the end of our animation and we'll create a new keyframe for both. And then for these, we'll select the value of our Y position to span about 64 pixels. We'll do that on both the top and bottom. So now we can see that as our animation expands, our letterbox expands within the frame. Now we can improve this by adding some easing to our smoothing value by selecting the first keyframe and selecting easing. And for my purposes, I'll set this to five, which gives us a nice steep ramp up towards the end of the frame transition. We'll do that same exact thing for the bottom. Perfect. And if we press play, we can see that it starts slow and the bars come into full picture fairly quickly in the last few milliseconds of the frame. Now that our UI has an animation player that has a animation to play, come into our script for the UI, bring in our animation player as a reference, and we'll also do a bind for our static variable called instance. This will be of type UI that by default has no value set. And inside our ready function, we'll be creating a call to that instance where we set equal to self if our instance is equal to null. Otherwise, it's the instance. Again, we're leveraging a singleton concept here, similar to what we did in previous videos. And we will also need a variable to track whether or not our letterbox is currently open. By default, we'll set it to false. Now we can set up our static functions for opening and closing our letterbox. To open our letterbox, we'll check whether or not our instance has a letterbox that's open. And if not, we'll take our instance's animation player and we'll call play on our open letterbox animation. Again, if you're not getting your autocomplete, make sure that you have your typing set. This is a type animation player. And once we start playing, we can tell our instance to set its internal letterbox open property equal to true. And for our closed letterbox, we'll check if our instance letterbox is open. And if it is, we'll take our animation player and we'll play backwards our open letterbox animation. From here, we'll take the letterbox open and set it to false. Now that we have the ability to open and close a letterbox on our UI, we can return back to our game. And inside our start game function, after we change our target to the crate, we will call our UI's open letterbox function. And right before we change our target back to our tank, we'll call our UI's close letterbox. And if we give this a test, we can see that the letterboxing worked. We'll notice that our camera didn't seem to target anywhere specific. If we drive our tank around, we can see that our camera starts to move to follow us. If we move our cursor around, we can see we're kind of stuck to the side wall. That's because of our limits. Our limits are keeping us constrained within 
perspective view of our world. We bring our tank further away from those limits. We can see that the mouse follow is working in all directions. To fix this, if we go to our game, into our scene, we move our tank further away from the limits. We can also move the camera closer to our tank. We could have it pan in from the north by having our camera start initially above our target. Save that and if we rerun, you can see our camera pans to our tank, then pans to the nearest crate, then back to our tank. Now we have control. Now it's great that we have the ability to move our camera based off our mouse's position. Let's also update our tank's turret to point in the same direction as well. We open up our tank scene and into the tank script, we can update our physics process inside our weapon rotation. Here, we'll be replacing our rotation direction from our input to using our new mouse position. Here, we'll specify that our mouse position is equal to the local mouse position. And from here, we'll be creating a new transform that's equal to our weapons transform that is looking at the direction of our mouse position. Then we'll take that weapon transform and we'll set it equal to the current weapon transform with an interpolated value using the interpolate with function, passing in our new transform and doing this over a time of our rotate speed multiplied by delta. Note that our default rotate speed, which we've defined here as a constant, will determine how fast our turret moves towards our mouse's position. Our default value would be pretty quick. If you want your turret to move slower towards your mouse's position, you could decrease the rotate speed. And if we run on a game, we can see that our turret now follows our mouse's position. This looks much better in conjunction with our camera smoothing its mouse position as well. Let's create a new mouse cursor icon. For my project, I've created a simple 8x8 mouse cursor. You can download this file from the GitHub project linked in the video description below, or you can create your own. Back inside of our UI, we'll be creating our cursor manager using a type of just node, and we'll call this cursor manager. And here we'll attach a new script that will also be saved in the UI script folder. The goal of our cursor manager is to take our window size and a given cursor texture and keep that texture resolution scaled based off the size of our window. To do this, we'll export two variables, one for our base window size, well, this will be a vector two. We'll default this to vector 2.0. Second, we'll export a variable for our cursor texture. This will be a type of texture 2D. This will set a ready function that starts by updating our cursor. And here we'll define a update cursor function. Before we do so, we'll also want to take our current tree and get the root, which will be our root window. We're gonna call on our size change signal to connect to our update cursor function. This means that if we rescale or resize our window, that we'll also be calling our update cursor function. Now inside this function, we'll get our current window size and set that equal to the viewport size an implicit type here. We'll also be creating a scale multiple. It will be a minimum value of our floored value, taking our current window size and its X position. We'll divide this value by our base window size X position. That'll be our minimum value and our maximum value will be the floored value of our current window size using the Y position divided by the base window size Y position. This is essentially getting us the scaled resolutions aspect ratio. In GNOME 4, the get viewport size is no longer valid. So instead we can use the same get tree dot get root to get our window. 
and we can get our size from the window. This should be a type of vector 2i, which can be inferred from the method call. Now from here, we'll take a, a image that we get from our cursor texture, and we will get the image data. We'll create a scalar from our cursor texture, where we get the size and multiply that by our scale multiple plus one. We'll take our image and we will resize it using our scalar, passing in our image flag for interpolate nearest, keeping our pixelated texture. Next, we'll take a texture. We'll set that equal to a image texture that we'll create from our image data. And for our input class, we will be setting a custom mouse cursor equal to that new texture, replacing our input cursor arrow using our scalar multiplied in half. This will center our image on the middle of our cursor's pointer. Now it's important to note that when you're dealing with resolution scaling or window-based scaling, that inside your project settings, your display window stretch mode is very important. Note that this says that the viewport type or mode of stretch, that the scene is rendered to a viewport first and then is scaled. This is typically what you would use for a pixel art aesthetic. Though in our case, we are using the canvas items to take advantage of scaling. In the viewport mode, you would notice that as your screen got smaller, that your icon by perspective would be larger. And as your screen gets larger, the cursor, which would stay the same size, would appear smaller. By using canvas items, it allows our cursor to scale independently as our viewport scales as well. So now we can select our cursor manager and inside our base window size, we want to set this to the default resolution, which again, we can get from our project settings under the display window. We've set ours to a viewport width of 960 by 544. So we can set that here, 960 by 544. And if we bring in our sprite for our cursor icon, we can take our cursor, drag that into our cursor texture, save that, run our game. And we can see that our cursor has its icon changed to our custom cursor icon. And if we resize our window, we can see that our cursor icon scales in contrast. Great. And now we have a camera in our game that can swap between multiple modes and can be defined to focus on specific targets that we've set. So long as our target has a position, we can focus there. We also have nice letterboxing that can be included in our UI while focusing on those specific targets. And our camera and turret will follow our mouse cursor as we move it across the screen. We've also added custom cursor icons that can be used to immerse our users a bit more into the feel of our game. As always, there's so much more that we could add to our camera and cursor icons. This really is just the tip of the iceberg. Let me know down in the comments below any additional ideas that you would have for types of camera modes or cursor icons or other behaviors that you would add to this functionality. And if you've enjoyed this video, please leave a like. And if you aren't already, please do consider subscribing as it does help the channel grow. And if you wanna get more engaged, join our growing Discord community. Links for that are in the description down below. And as always, thanks for watching and happy coding.